Welcome back, brothers and sisters, to the viewing of DVD number four in our series, Prophecy. And again, we are going to continue where we left off at, at disc three with a weapon of mass destruction. Now, before we get into today's um, disc, I want to mention the fact that in our last mail out, some of you might have received a disc three label with this one information on it. We don't know how it happened. We don't know how we ended up getting our information from this one on a label disc three. But if you did receive a disc three, but had this one information on it, we just asked you to uh, email us, call us or what have you, and we will put you the correct disc in the mail. We apologize for that. And again, don't know how it happened. Also, we'd just like to say we are moving forward with the building. Um, we're just pray for us that we can get this thing up and running sometime around the first of the year. Now, we want to have a word of prayer and get into the information of today. We are still studying history in depth. And I just ask you to bear with me as we go through this. Let's be prayerful. Let's be serious, brothers and sisters. I believe, based on prophecy, that we are so close to the end. And most of God's people know nothing about it. So let us have a word of prayer. Let us be very serious, saints. Let us ask God to help us as we begin to dig into his word once again, as we begin to look at what he has given us to let us know where we are and what we need to be doing for the times in which we live. Let us pray at this time, and then we will get into our study for today. Father in heaven, again, in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, we come before thy righteous and holy throne. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. And now, Lord, as we begin to study again, teach us. Please let the Holy Spirit be here with us. Be with those that will be viewing this information. We pray, Lord, that the, the promise that you gave us in John 16, that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth and will show us things to come. We ask, Lord, we remind you, help us to see this. And then, Lord, help us to become witnesses for thee, to share this truth with others. Now, Lord, let the Spirit be here with us. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Thank you for all you have done for us and all that you will do for us. Let us, Lord, recognize the seriousness of the times. Let us not be, let us not be frivolous. Let me not be frivolous. It is serious. Thank you for hearing this prayer. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I want to remind you that we are, have been dealing with events in the French Revolution. I want to take you back to the screen just to remind you of some of the things that we have covered thus far. Just, not, just a short, very short review, very short review. Looking at our screen, we have been talking about a weapon of mass destruction. We have been talking about an attack on the mind, and that out of the French Revolution came a group named the Illuminati, at least they were actually before they were there, they were instigators, and their goal was to replace Christianity by a religion of reason. I want you to understand, saints, that Satan, we are in a warfare with Satan. We have a book called The Great Controversy that we are all very familiar with, and it is a battle over the control of our minds. And once Satan saw that he was losing his control through the medium of the papacy, we're told that he came up with a new manifestation of satanic power to make open a vowed war upon the word of God. You must understand that Satan's game plan is to prevent you and I from tying into that power source made available at the cross. When we look at Revelation, the 12th chapter, when the Bible says that he knew that he had but a short time, he knew that he had but a short time to prevent you and I from tying into that power source made available at the cross. Continuing on from the screen. And so Satan's game plan is to wipe out the word of God out of man. This is, this is his battle now, to wipe out the word of God. So in, in, in order to do that, he has replaced 
the word of God with a religion of reason. And the name of that religion of reason is humanism. And we're going, as we, now, as we continue now in our study today, we're going to explore these things. We need to, we need to now start from the French Revolution and now move forward in time. We need to move all the way down until the end of time, to where we are now in 2010. So Satan's game plan is to replace God, the word of God, with a religion of reason. And that religion of reason is nothing else but humanism, as we are going to discover today. 1793, during the Ring of Terror, when the Bibles were burned and destroyed and the churches was closed in France, the King James Bible of 1611 was the Bible that was prominent at that time. Today, the Bible that is prominent is the NIV. That's the prominent Bible today, which was uh, translated or printed and put into production around the 1970s. And it's very key that what, when, that, when that took place, as we, as, as we now move along the time chart, and we're going to move all the way down today, we're going to move all the way down to 1989, and then we're going to back up. And we need to study, saints. We need to study. I, I don't want you to go and say, Brother Mason said anything. I want you to be able to see this with your own eyes. I want you to understand it and be able then to share it with others. So let's, let's get into uh, this study today and let's dig into this thing and let us understand it and let us see what we need to, to do. Continuing on. On our screen, we have the seven churches, we have the seven powers, the seven uh, nations or what have you, and we have the seven seals and at the bottom we have the sanctuary. And we, in the sanctuary, we also have our seven events, our seven feast days that, that are typical, but they have an anti-typical fulfillment. And we're in number six as we speak. But if we look at the, at the top, we, have the, we see that we are in the seventh church. Now, I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. We're going to take our time. A builder a contractor, if we want to build a house, a building, what have you, we're building a building right now. The first thing we did was we laid the ground, we, we cleared off the ground, and then we put a foundation down. And from that foundation, we began to build up. And you, in our last mailing, we put some of the pictures and how we progressed along as we, as we began to put this building up. Now, there's a blueprint for putting up the building, putting up a house. So when a contractor comes to, to, to start a building, he doesn't look at the, at, at the blueprint and say, okay, let's build a roof. That, that would be totally out of sequence. I mean, what, what is the roof going to sit on? And so God has given us a blueprint of events along the way from when sin entered the world until when sin will be annihilated, saints. There is a blueprint. Matter of fact, in Great Controversy 598, he says, we have a chart pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey and we ought not to guess at anything. God has given us a blueprint. Now, if God has given us a blueprint, that means God understands what's going to take place all along the way. As you saw in the introduction, that God is overruling all things for his own purpose. And so as we look back in history and see the events that are taking place, God already pre-programmed our I, I, I told us ahead of time through prophecy what was going to take place, when it was going to take place, and how it was going to take place. So we need to look at God's blueprint and un, to understand where we are and what we need to be doing for the times in which we live. So as we look at this chart, we see, saints, that we are already in the seventh church. There's no more churches after the seventh church. There's not another church. So we're already in church number seven, the Laodicean church. As we look at this chart on the screen, we see that we're already in the sixth head. And we're going to talk about the sixth head some more. We're in the sixth seal. And we're in the day of atonement, which is number six in the sanctuary. Now, when, number, when, 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 when the seventh head comes on, which is America, brothers and sisters, it's too late to get ready because America does not become a part of this head system until she passes the Sunday law. That's when she speaks as a dragon. Are you with me, saints? We're in the sixth seal. When we move out of the sixth, under the sixth seal, Jesus comes. So there's no more activity on this earth under the sixth, after the sixth seal. The seventh seal, we're on our way to heaven. We're in the sixth event in the sanctuary. We're in the day of atonement. When the day of atonement ends, brothers and sisters, 
that the priest comes out of the most holy place and goes into the outer court and places his head on the scapegoat and sends that scapegoat out into the wilderness. Well, brothers and sisters, when Jesus comes out of the most holy place in the sanctuary above, he comes to this earth and he places the sins of all the repentant sinners upon the head of Satan. And now Satan is led into the wilderness, which will be this earth that's, that's, that is destroyed. So brothers and sisters, we're in number six. Number seven, which is a feast of tabernacles, as you see on your screen, will be actually celebrated in heaven. We have a blueprint. We are, we're in the seventh church. We're in the sixth head. We're in the sixth seal. And we're in the sixth event in the sanctuary. And that's the reason the prophet says that we need to understand the sanctuary in order to, to understand prophecy. Are you going to be with me? Are you going to study with me today? And so look what the prophet says now. This chart, by the way, was in the newsletter, the last newsletter that you got, but I want to just go through it just for a moment. Look what it says now. The book with seven seals contains the history of the world. Do you understand that, brothers and sisters? The book with seven seals contains the history of the world. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Here is a book that contains the whole history of the world, saints. Let's continue. There in his open hand lay the book, the role of the history of God's providences, the prophetic history of nations and the church. Here in what's contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws, the whole symbolic council of the eternal, and the history of all ruling powers in the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation tongue, and people from the beginning of earth's history to its close. Brothers and sisters, do we understand that in these, in these seven seals contains the whole history of the world? Let's go, to our, let's go to our Bibles. Let's go to Revelation the 13th chapter, and let's look at verses 11. Revelation in 13th chapter, looking at verses 11. Open your Bibles. King James Bible, not an NIV. I want to make sure that we understand. We don't, we, don't, we don't need that NIV. Revelation 13, chapter, verses 11. And the Bible says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. I might have said Revelation 13. I meant Romans 13. Romans 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. How do we know the time, brothers and sisters? Paul is telling us that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Brothers and sisters, we are in the seventh church. We're in the sixth uh, seal. We're in the sixth head. And we're in the sixth event in the sanctuary. And so we can certainly know the time. There's only one after that. We can certainly know the time. And we can, we're going, by the grace of God, we're going to break this on down so we can fully know the time. Let me tell you something, saints. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11th chapter concerning Enoch that, I mean, not Enoch, concerning Noah, that Noah moved by faith and built an ark to the saving of his household. Had Noah waited until the first drop of rain fell in order to build an ark, it would have been much, much too late. What am I saying, saints? We need to, by faith right now, determine in our hearts that we're going to do what God says do based on his word. No matter that we don't see any, any rain falling, God has said certain things are going to take place, and, we, and God has laid out a blueprint, and this is what's going to happen. And so we need to look at prophecy and understand this thing. And by the way, the Bible tells us, matter of fact, let's go to 
uh, 2 Peter 1, verses 19. 2 Peter 1, verses 19. I want us to understand this today. Please just bear with me, brothers and sisters. This is serious things, serious stuff that we're talking about. And I have not forgotten when we, when we ended this three, we were talking about giving a name to this, this six head. And we're going to do that. I have not forgotten. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19, the Bible says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Let's continue on with verses 20 and 21. We're going to continue on with verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. I want to really, for us to understand that it is of no private interpretation. God has already laid out what's going to be. We can't come up with our own private interpretation. What we need to do is let the Bible interpret itself. Let us look at history and see how history has fulfilled what God has said was going to be. When we get into private interpretation, we get all messed up. When we get into our own uh, our sentimental uh, understanding of something versus what the Word of God says, it gets us in trouble. So we, as we study this thing, we must look at what God has said is going to be and take, take our thinking and put it into what God has said is going to be. Let's continue. Verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the reason I want to emphasize this is because right now, brothers and sisters, every wind of doctrine is blowing among us as a people. There's so much dichotomy of what, what, what the Word of God means and what it says and what, what's this, that, and whatever. We need to carefully study and evaluate what God has said is going to be. God has given us a blueprint. And it's not up to us to decide what God meant, but let God tell us what he meant. Let God show us what he, what he said. Jesus says, I tell you before it come to pass, so when it has come to pass, ye might believe. Continue. So here we see, we're in the seventh church, we're in the sixth head, we're in the sixth seal, and we're in the sixth event in the sanctuary. There's only one after number, after number six. And we're in the seventh church, the sixth head, the sixth seal, and the sixth event in the sanctuary. Let's continue. In our introduction, we, we showed you that we are passed by Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Paper Rome, and we are now in that sixth head. Look what the prophet says from Great Controversy, page 594. Great Controversy, page 594. Let's study today, saints. Study to show ourselves approved. Great Controversy, 594. I'm putting it on the screen. Before his crucifixion, the Savior explained to his disciples that he was to be put to death and to rise again from the tomb. And angels were present to impress his words on minds and hearts, but the disciples were looking for temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke. And they could not tolerate the thought that he in whom all their hopes centered should suffer an ignominious death. The words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds, and when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The death of Jesus as fully described their hopes as if he had not forewarned them. Let's continue. Let's see what else the prophet has to say concerning this event. She says, so in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it were open to the disciples. Did you hear that, saints? So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected, listen to this, saints. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble is clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Brothers and sisters, so in the prophecies, the events connected to the close of probation are clearly presented. Let's let this soak in. So in the prophecies, the events 
connected to the close of probation are clearly presented. I believe that. And so if they are clearly presented, then I need to go and study. You and I need to go and study. We need to see what it is that lets us know where we are. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. I want to emphasize again, Babylon has passed off the scene. Medo-Persia has passed off the scene. Greece has passed off the scene. Rome has passed off the scene. Paper Rome has passed off the scene. We are in the sixth head. But I want you to understand, saints, we are not at the beginning of the sixth head. We are at the end of the sixth head. For certainly the sixth head came on in 1798 or thereafter. So it's been on the scene for years. So we're not at the beginning of the sixth head. We are at the end of the sixth head, which prophecy is going to show us and prove to us that we're at the end of the sixth head. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? I tell you, this is so serious. I believe we need to have another word of prayer. Just let us, let, let us just be real, real uh, serious about this study today because we, God's people need to understand these things. Let us pray again. Father in heaven, as we continue, as we begin to dig deep into your word, we are pleading, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will attach itself to every word that is spoken, to every slide that is presented. And those that are viewing this will be viewing this information and they will understand it so much that it, their hearts will burn. And Lord, that they will decide that they must go and share this with others. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the prophet tells us that she saw jets of light all over the world. Saints, you need to become one of those jets of light that is disseminating this truth all over the world. Let us continue. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. Now, we want to put a name on this one is head. Now, the Bible has already given it a name. The Bible has given it at least three names. Ellen G. White, this Holy Spirit speaking through Ellen G. White has given it a name, which would be four names. And we're going to look at these four names that the Bible has already given us. And there's others. And then we're going to, so all these names that the Bible has given to this, 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 this one is head uh, is very significant. The first thing we want to, I, I put them in sequence so that we can, we, we, we can kind of can build on it, you know. So let's look at it. The first name that is given to this one is head of Revelation, the 17th chapter, is the king of the south. The first name is given is called the king of the south. Because, and this king of the south, as we're going to read from, uh, from Daniel 11, 40 later on, it is the king of the south that comes against the king of the north, which is the papacy. So now many people, I've heard, well not many, but I've heard some say, well, th this, this six head can't be in ideology, can't be uh, th these uh, none entities. It has to be a nation because Babylon was a nation, Medo-Persia was a nation, Greece was a nation, Pagan Rome was a nation, but guess what? Paper Rome was not a nation. It was a spiritual entity at that time with worldwide control. So we know that Paper Rome is head number five. It is not a nation. It is a spiritual entity with worldwide control. And so, brothers and sisters, the king of the south that comes against the king of the north in Daniel 1140 does not have to be a physical nation. And it's not a physical nation as we're going to plainly see. But I want you to know that the Bible calls it the king of the South. So it is a king. It is a king because the Bible calls it the king of the South. And it is the entity that came against the papacy in 1798 and gave the papacy a deadly wound. And we've already discovered from this three that it came out of the French Revolution. We've already discovered that it was Berthier that went down and took the Pope prison, but we've already discovered that it was the directory that sent him down there to take the Pope prisoner. And it all came out of the French Revolution. Is France the, the, the king of the South? If so, brothers and sisters, France 
glory days under Napoleon didn't last no long in 1814, 1815, something like that. So that means if France was the sixth head, it would have been long gone. So no, France is not the sixth head. It came out of France. The ideology came out of France. Let's continue. So the Bible calls it the king of the south. That's what the Bible calls it. The Bible also calls it, uh, rather it calls it the one is head in which since five had fallen, then the next one is had to be number six. So we have labeled it the six head because the Bible says five are fallen. One is, the other's not yet coming. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. So the one is head here is the six head. And this six head cannot come on the scene until the fifth head has gone down. And the fifth head went down in 1798. So when John sees this vision, five had fallen, one is, and the other had not yet come. So when John sees this vision, he's seeing this vision after 1798. And it is the sixth head, and the Bible calls it the one is head. Are you with me, saints? So the king of the south, which made the attack upon the papacy, brought about the downfall, is number six, the king of the south. That's the one that did it. It's number six. It's the one is head. Let's continue. The Bible also calls it the beast from the bottomless pit, Revelation 11, chapter, verses 8 calls it the beast from the bottomless pit. But the beast from the bottomless pit that attacked God's word in, in France is the same as the king of the south that also attacked the papacy. And the Bible calls it the one is head, which is the six head. And then Ellen G. White ties it, a new manifestation of satanic power. So here we have four names. We have the king of the south. We have the six head of the one is head. We have the beast from the bottomless pit. Uh, we have a new manifestation of satanic power. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Are you with me now? We are studying. Now let's continue and see what else the prophet has to say about this from great controversy. Oh, she says, The period when the two witnesses were to prophesy clothed in sackcloth ended in 1798. As they were approaching the termination of their work in obscurity, war was to be made upon them by the power represented as the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. Here we see that Ellen G. White takes the text from, from Revelation 11, chapter, verses 8, and applies it to this new manifestation of satanic power. Look what she says. War was to be made upon them by the power represented as the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. In many of the nations of Europe, the powers that ruled in church and state had for centuries been controlled by Satan through the medium of the papacy, but here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. So Ellen G. White takes Revelation 11, chapter, verses 8, and applies that beast from the bottomless pit that attacks the word of God in France. She, she calls it a new manifestation of satanic power to make open about war upon the word of God. And it is the same new manifestation of satanic power. It is this same beast from the bottomless pit that progressed on through the French Revolution that eventually brought about the deadly wound to the papacy. Now you ask, why would Satan allow the papacy to go down? Satan didn't allow anything. God has said they were going to go down. God has the blueprint. Satan can't do anything about the blueprint. God has said they were going down in 1798. You understand what we're saying there, saints? And so what happened is God said they are going down, and that was the reason that they, had, that they had to go down in 1798, because God's church had to come on the scene. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's continue. It had been Rome's policy under a profession of reverence for the Bible to keep it locked up in an unknown tongue and hidden away from the people. Under her rule, the witnesses prophesied clothed in sackcloth, talking about the the Word of God, talking about the Old and the New Testament, the witnesses. But another power, look what she says, but another power, the beast from the bottomless pit was to arise to make open about war upon the Word of God. So here we see that this beast from the bottomless pit was to arise to make open about war upon the Word of God. And we see this, this taking place in the French Revolution. But it just wasn't for three and a half years, brothers and sisters. This ideology that came out of the French Revolution is still with us today, very much alive and well. Let's continue. Let's continue now. Let's continue as we continue searching 
the word of God to see what this six head is and how. Now, I want, uh, let us, let us, let, I want you to understand we're going to follow this now out of the French Revolution. We're going to bring it all the way down to 1989. Then once we get down to 1989, we're going to back up and start another leg of this and bring it down again. So we're going to follow this now. We're going to follow this new manifestation of satanic power out of the French Revolution and come all the way down to the end of time, to, to 1989 road. Let's go. 1798, and on our right we have 2010. Look what, the, look what Churchill says. Now, we've, we've, already, we've already put this chart up there on our, in our last slide, but I want to go back and just look what Churchill says. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of England, stated to the London press in 1922, from the days of Spartacus Westhop, Karl Marx, Trosi, Bella Khan, Rosa Luxemburg, and Emma Goldman, this worldwide conspiracy has been steadily growing. This conspiracy played a definite, recognizable role in the tragedy of the French Revolution. Churchill pegs it. Look what he says. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century, and now at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their head and have become the undisputed masters of that enormous empire. Churchill is saying that this ideology that came out of the French Revolution is active in the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Let's continue. Again, I want to remind you of what Encyclopedia Britannica, 15th edition, has to say. It says that this was a short-lived movement, talking about the Illuminati, founded as a secret society in 1776 in Bavaria by Adam Westhop. That's who he's talking about up here, Westhop. Professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt and a former Jesuit. Its aim was to replace Christianity by a religion of reason. It was banned by the Bavarian government in 1785. Can we argue with history? When the, 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 the Encyclopedia Britannica clearly says that the Illuminati, their goal was to replace Christianity with a religion of reason. Can we argue with history? And when God has said this is going to take place. Let's continue, brothers and sisters. So Churchill says out of the French Revolution of 1789, that conspiracy, that ideology is still alive and well in 1917, which is 129 years down the road. That's history, brothers and sisters. Let's continue. 129 years. That's communism. We know that the Bolshevik Revolution brought about communism. Where did this communism come from? Where did this idea of communism, what is this communism? Where did it come from? Ellen G. White names it. In Great Controversy, she calls it atheism. Well, communism is nothing but atheism. Communism is nothing but atheism. Atheism is nothing. Well, not atheism, no necessary to be communism, but communism is definitely atheism. Let's go. Here we have the Communist Manifesto. We all know about the Communist Manifesto. We know who wrote it. But I just want to read just a little bit from it, just a little bit. The very first, it, it, when you get into the, to, to, the, to the Communist Manifesto, it says the very first line when it starts off says, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. The French Revolution was a class struggle. And Ellen G. White says that the teachings that led to the French Revolution would all take place again at the end of time in education, page 228. We want to see how the, what happened in the French Revolution is impacting us down here today and what's going to be the result of this impact. How is it all going to play out? Because saints, it, what took the, the, the French Revolution is a watershed event that puts light on end time prophecy. Continuing on, social history is nothing other than a record of past struggles between distinct social classes. In the modern industrial world, the most significant classes are the burgages, people who own uh, resources, factories, and other means of production, and the proletarists, people who work for wages in its effort to. So here we have the, 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 the burgages and the proletarists, two different classes of people. People who work for wages in its effort to succeed, the 
Virgeist must constantly revise and renew the means of production, ensuring a constant infusion of capital by building larger cities, promoting, promoting new products, and securing cheaper commodities. This is from the Communist Manifesto. Where did Marx, who was born in 1818, 10 years after the papacy has received the French, uh, have received the, the deadly wound, where did Marx in 1848, where did, he get this, where did he get this idea from in the first place? Let's see, where did he get this idea from? Here's a book called The French Revolution, Marx and the French Revolution. And this book is talking about the influence that the French Revolution had upon Karl Marx. In other words, by the time that Karl Marx was born in 1818, this ideology that came out of the French Revolution was right in Europe, and particularly in France, because, you know, we had another revolution in France in 1848 as well. So it was right. And so this, the influence of the French Revolution set upon the all of Europe, but Marx in particular picked up this ideology and he ran with it starting around 1835. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? It says, throughout his life, Karl Marx commented on the French Revolution, but never was able to realize his project of systematic work on this immense event. So the French Revolution had an immense effect upon Karl Marx, which enabled him, or uh, uh, inspired him, to write the Communist Manifesto, which is Lenin used in 1917 in the Bolshevik Revolution. So we see the connection coming out of the French Revolution, its influence, as it moves now down through time. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? We're talking about prophecy. Talking again about Marx. He earned a doctorate at Jena in 1841, writing on the materialism and atheism of Greek autonomists. Saints, I hope you don't get bored with studying history. You know, in order to understand prophecy, we must go back and look at history. The Bible tells us in Isaiah. As a matter of fact, let's go to Isaiah 42.9. Isaiah 42.9. And remember what we, what we read earlier in, uh, in, in, in Great Controversy. So in the prophecies, the future is laid out plain. The events connected to the close of probation are plainly revealed. Isaiah 42.9. We're in class today with the Holy Spirit. What the Bible says, Isaiah 42.9. Behold. This is God talking. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you, behold, the former things have come to pass. We are looking at the former things. We are looking at what have already taken place that God said was going to take place. He says, behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So in order for us to understand what the new things are, we need to look at the former things and follow it down through time. Ellen G. White tells us, matter of fact, I'm going to read it right quick. Ellen White tells us in this book, Education Page 178. Education Page 178. I'm going to read it. Education Page 178. She says, the history which the great I am has marked out in his word Uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity in the future tells us where we are today in the possession of the ages and what may be expected in the time to come. All that prophecy has foretold has coming to pass until the present time has been traced on the pages of history and we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. Brothers and sisters, it's all, it's going to, God has laid out the blueprint of what's going to be. It's going to be fulfilled in its order. And so we need to look at the order and walk it down and see what it means. And I want to tell you, saints, today that we are at the end of time. We're not at the beginning of the sixth year. We're at the end of the sixth year. Let's continue. So Marx 
was influenced by the events of the French Revolution. Let's see what else Mark has to say now in, in his Communist Manifesto. And Carter Encyclopedia says Mark was the founder of communism and as such one of the most influential thinkers of all times. The doctrines of Karl Marx revived by most socialists after his death were revived by Valerie Itch Lenin, who developed and applied them. They became the core of the theory of Bolshevism and the third international soul. We see that the history books says that Marx was instrumental in bringing about this communism, but we know that Marx got it out of the French Revolution. A class struggle. Are you with me, saints? Let's continue. We're studying. Look what else Marx has to say. So communism. Part two of the manifesto declares that declares the intention of communism to overthrow the Burgergeist and to situate all political powers in the belligerents uh, instead. So it was a class struggle. The teachings that led to the French Revolution, the class struggle, the, the two opposing influences. Now watch it, saints. Now let's go down to the bottom of this. As he talks about what he would do. He says women would be empowered in their own right as workers instead of being subject to, denom to domination by male burger guys, progressive taxation would provide for a redistribution of capital. Are you hearing this, brothers and sisters? And the struggle between the classes would be in the list of practical aims at the end of part two is impressive. And many of his speeches have been implemented throughout the world during the past century and a half. I want to make a point here, saints. We want to make a point in this statement that he makes. There would be a redistribution of wealth, according to his plan, and women would be empowered in their own right as workers. Now, I, 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 look, I'm not saying that women shouldn't be empowered. I'm not saying, I'm, not, I'm just telling you what the goal of the Communist Manifesto was, because we want to see how it has played out down here at the end time. But we're not looking at a Communist Manifesto just for the sake of that. We are looking at prophecy because the prophet has said that what took place in France would take place at the end of time. When we see this taking place, we will know where we are. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's continue. Let's continue. The next person we want to look at is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was born into a wealthy, prominent family in England. After graduating from high school, Darwin attended the University of Edinburgh to study medicine but dropped out after two years and entered the University of Cambridge in preparation for the clergy. After graduating from Cambridge in 1831 and before entering the clergy, Darwin spent five years as an unpaid naturalist aboard the English survey ship, the HMS Beagle. It is during this time as Darwin traveled from continent to continent observing and studying different species that his mind became tainted with the idea of natural selection of the species and the theory of evolution. Darwin studied and fine-tuned his theory until 1859 when he published his work, The Origin of the Species. So now we have Charles Darwin on the scene. He, uh, uh, Marx, Communist Manifesto, 1848, Darwin, The Origin of the Species, 1859, 11 years apart. Watch it. Now let's look at this. The naturalist explanation for the origins of matter and man did not begin with Charles Darwin in the 19th century, but appears side by side with the supernatural explanation at the time of the Greeks. Now, I wish I had time to get into what the Greeks believe, but we don't have time in this video. And undoubtedly goes back even beyond this early period of man's history. An important consequence of this line of thinking follows. By the nine and intelligent creator, listen to what we're reading here, by denying an intelligent creator, or even denying that he is vitally interest, interested in the affairs of man, then men must look to man as the intelligence necessary to run the affairs of the world. This is humanism. Humanism has steadily risen in opposition to theism throughout history, reaching a peak at the time of the French Revolution in 1789. The work of Charles Darwin, listen to this statement, saints, listen to this statement. We are looking at history. We are studying history in order to understand prophecy. Listen to this. The work of Charles Darwin later provided the scientific foundation for humanism. 
Since his time, humanistic reasoning has been built upon this foundation until it has become the dominant worldview today. So this humanistic reasoning that Darwin uh, was the instigator or progenitor of has now become the dominant worldwide view today. Now remember, Marx, who got his, uh, his, 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 his uh, was influenced by the French Revolution. Well, the people in the French Revolution didn't believe in God. That's what they said. Look, we want to replace re religion with reason. We want to replace religion with reason. So this is, Darwin was influenced by this as well. Can you see this? So Marx and Darwin both were influenced by the French Revolution. Let's continue things. So here we have now atheism, communism, which now can, can merge right with this evolutionary theory that Darwin has come up with. Let's continue things. I hope you'll follow me. We're calling this the anti-genesis apostasy. This is a phrase borrowed from George McCready Price's book called Time of the End. Anti-genesis apostasy. That in other words, anti-genesis means what we see here in the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If we listen to Charles Darwin, there is no in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We all evolved from something. There's a Big Bang Theory. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So here now we see two, uh, two ideologies moving and merging together. Communism and this evolution merging together, coming out of the French Revolution. Let's go. Anti-Genesis apostasy, which is nothing but secular humanism. Anti-Genesis apostasy, which is nothing but secular humanism. Now, again, uh, George McCready Price in his book, Time of the End, is the one that coined this phrase, anti-genesis apostasy, but that is a correct phrase. It is an anti-genesis. It is an anti-Bible. It is an anti-God. It is an anti-creator apostasy. That's what it is. Came out of the French Revolution. Let's continue, brothers and sisters. Looking at us now, uh, our statement by George McCready Price, and we have at the top of our uh, slide here, we have French Revolution, and then we have our arrow coming down to atheism. Now, George McCreary Price says in his book, Time of the Ends, 1967, read, read the following. Of course, in its sporadic, unorganized form, atheism or infidelity has always existed. That's true. Back, at, back in Egypt, when Pharaoh said, who is God that I should serve him? So atheism has always existed. But in 1793, it was organized and gain control of one of the leading nations of Europe. Now, brothers and sisters, the reason we want to make sure that you understand what came out of the French Revolution, because we got to follow it down, because when we see a counterattack take place in Daniel 1140, we want to be able to identify who the counterattack is against and prove that God's word is true and see where we are in prophetic history. But in 1793, it was organized and gained control of one of the leading nations of Europe. And with fanatical zeal, it set out to subdue or at least propagandize all the rest of the world. In that particular form and manner, its day was brief. In 1848, in the form of Marxism, communism, it seemed on the point of gaining power again. Then in 1917, it captured Russia, and a little later, China, and from these centers, it has spread out over more than half of the world's population. This is from George McCready's book, Our Time of the End. So here we, looking, at, looking to our left now, and on the screen, we have this French Revolution. We have atheism, which is what Ellen G. White called it. Atheism, this atheism came out of the French Revolution and it went to the East. It went to the East as communism. It went to the East as communism. This ideology that which Winston Churchill is talking about came out of the French Revolution and it went to the East as communism, Russia and China and all these. Let's continue. Another quote from George McCready Price. This is its organized, 
our national form. But we must not forget that every college and university throughout Europe and America, look what he says, every college and university throughout Europe and America, every newspaper and every other source of publicity or entertainment has for more than two generations been engaged in a far more subtle but no less effective campaign against the Bible doctrine of creation. Now, are you hearing what this man is saying? Are you hearing what's being said here, saints? Every college, in other words, he says, every college and university throughout Europe and America, every newspaper and every other source of publicity or entertainment has for more than two generations been engaged in a far more subtle but no less effective campaign against the Bible doctrine of creation, and thus against every other truth of revealed religion of which creation is the logical and indispensable foundation. So every college, every university, every, all the newspapers, the TV, the radio, everything has been engaged in a far more subtle attack against the Word of God. This is secular humanism. So out of the French Revolution, this atheism went to the East as communism, but it came to the West as secular humanism. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Are we on solid ground here? So we have communism and secular humanism that came out of the French Revolution. Let's continue. Again, George McCready Price coined the phrase anti-genesis apostasy. Anti-genesis apostasy. I'm calling it a weapon of mass destruction that have been unleashed upon the mind of human beings. Let's continue. Continuing on from George McCreary Price. He says, on this basis, the Americanization of religion throughout the Occidental world is only a varying form of the communism of China and Russia in the light of heavenly truth, these two systems are essentially twins. In other words, communism and secular humanism are twins. It's the same thing. It's an attack upon the word of God. It is an anti-genesis apostasy, brothers and sisters. Let's continue. Price says that every newspaper, every college, every university, the television, uh, the video games, look at these young kids down here, video games, everything is designed to get rid of God. Look what John Lennon says. This is John Lennon, quoting from John Lennon, one of the Beatles in 1966. Look what he says. Christianity will go, he says. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't, I needn't argue with that, he says. I'm right and I will be proved right. We are more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it that runs it for me. John Lennon, 1966. We're more popular than God. Why did John Lennon get an idea like that from? Every newspaper, every college, and every other form of entertainment, everything, brothers and sisters, is designed to destroy your belief in the Word of God. The music, everything, the books, everything is designed to destroy your belief in God. An anti-Genesis apostasy. Now, let's look at this chart. Five are fallen, one is. Ellen J. White calls this one is a new manifestation of satanic power. It is the king of the South. It is to, its goal is to make open of our war upon the Word of God. Let's look at some other things it's doing. It is a teaching, brothers and sisters. It is an ideology, brothers and sisters. It is a religion, brothers and sisters. It is vehemently opposed to God and the Bible. It is subtle, very subtle. It has taken complete control of every public grade and high school and all colleges and universities that are accredited by the state. I want to emphasize that are accredited by the state, even some others, but 
especially those that are accredited by the state. It is the most vicious virus that Satan has ever unleashed upon the human mind. It is a weapon of mass destruction. I want you to understand something. That Satan is in this for his life because, brothers and sisters, if a people can be produced that would vindicate the character of God, then it's over for Satan. You would say, well, it's already over for Satan. No. Satan is in this fight. But we know what prophets said, but Satan is in this fight because he is hoping that he can prevent God from getting a people that can stand before him without a mediator. Hebrews 11, 39, 40, that they without us shall not be made perfect. Someone has to vindicate God's character. Someone has to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Someone has to overcome sin, brothers and sisters. Let us be part of those someones. Continue. So, this one is here. Ellen G. White says it's atheism. She names it. We can see that it is Illuminism. This atheism is Illuminism. It is Communism. It is Suckling Humanism. It is an anti Genesis Apostles. It is the King of the South. It is the Beast from the Bottom's Pit. It is a new manifestation of Satanic power. It is the Sixth Head, or the One Is Head of Revelation, the 17th chapter. It is an ideology. It is a religion. As we continue, we're going to see that it is an ideology. It is a religion. It is permediated the whole world. We now have a generation of anti-Bible, God-hating youth. Let's continue, brothers and sisters. Its purpose is to make open avowed war upon the Word of God. There are many Seventh-day Adventists now that put their children into schools and wonder why when they come out of those schools that they no longer believe in the Three Angels' message. They no longer believe in the Seventh-day Adventist message. They no longer put any trust in the Bible. They no longer want to have anything to do with the Bible. They go up and parents are wondering what has happened. It's going to be obvious what has happened, brothers and sisters, in a little bit. On our screen, you want to know what an anti-Genesis apostasy is? Atheism, Illuminism, Communism, Secular Humanism? Let's see what it is. It is the belief that we came from some animal, some virus came out of the ocean, crawled up on the banks, and something happened to it and hit finally evolved over millions and millions and millions of years until we got to where we are in man. And here's the progression of this, this, this slime that came up off the, off of the, off of the, the, the banks of some, some river or somewhere. Brothers and sisters, how stupid. But Satan has been able to, to, to take control of man's mind to believe this foolishness. It's an anti-genesis positive. Evolution. How in the world could our, could our schools get to the point where we have professors that would teach evolution as fact? How did we get here, brothers and sisters? Let's go back to Daniel 11, 11 chapter. Daniel 11, verses 40. Daniel 11, verses 40. Because now we want to follow this communism down, down through time. I have it on the screen because we're, we're going to break it down. We want to break down Daniel 11:40 from the screen. The Bible says, and at the time of the end, what is, when was this time of the end? It was 1798. At the time of the end, 1798. We have an attack. Shall the king of the south push at him? So in 1798, the king of the south pushes at the king of the north, which is the papacy. Then we have a counterattack in that verse also, because in 1798, the king of the south pushes at the king of the north. 
Then the counterattack, and the king of the north, which is the papacy, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So in Daniel 11, 4, we have the attack by the king of the south that administers the deadly wound to the papacy. But in that same verse, we have a counterattack by the papacy. And so in, we, now we know who the king of the south is here. We, are, we, we know now. It's an anti genesis policy. It is communism. It went to the, to the east as communism. It came to the west as secular humanism. And it, 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 it is atheism. It, 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 is a, it is a luminism. That's the ideology of it. But it went to the, to, the, to the east as communism. It came to the west as secular humanism. So here we see in Daniel 11, 4, that this ideology, this thing, it attacked the papacy. It brought about a deadly wound to the papacy. But then in that same verse, we have a counterattack by the papacy. So we, we, we know that nowhere around 1798, 99, uh, 1800s that the papacy attacked anybody. They didn't have no power. They, the papacy went down, down, down. Matter of fact, in 1870, they shut themselves up in the Vatican. So what is this verse talking about? It says, and the king of the north, the papacy, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, we covered a little bit of this in uh, the series, The Decision Time, number one. But we had to co go back through this because we get to walk this all the way through this time. So in, in, in Daniel 11.40, a total of 191 years is covered from the attack by the king of the south upon the the, the king of the north, and the counterattack by the papacy 191 years later. Now, in order for this to be true, it would mean that the papacy, in making a counterattack, would have to make a counterattack upon communism as a beginning of the bringing down of the six head. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Because it is... It is this ideology of, uh, of this atheism that went to the east as communism came to the west as secular humanism that brought about the deadly wound upon the papacy in 1798. So in order for the, the papacy to make a counterattack and for it to fit prophecy, then the papacy would have to, by some means, make an attack upon communism, which would be a prerequisite to, making a, to bringing about the downfall of secular humanism throughout the world. And we know that secular humanism cannot be brought down until we have a national Sunday law. Let's look at it, saints. The counterattack begins. This is Newsweek, 1989. The caption says, changing the course of history. Standing up for freedom, people of the year. And I put over here on the right, communism. 1989, we have the counterattack begins. Look at this one, brothers and sisters. The Pope's role in the collapse of communism. The Pope's role in the collapse of communism. The Pope's role in the collapse of communism. When? King of the North. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. From Daniel 8, 24, we see that talking about this little horn power, he would come up and say his power would be mighty, but not by his own power. So in order for the papacy to, to be able to bring about the downfall of communism, it must have some power to help it do this. That's what the Bible says, what the prophet says. His power should be mighty, but not by his own power. All through the dark ages, the papacy didn't, I mean, the, the, the Pope didn't have an army to go out and kill all these people that they killed, 50 to 100 million. He had a civil power to stand by his side to do all this, to do his bidding from. His power should be mighty, but not by his own power. So in order for the papacy to be able to bring about the downfall of communism, it must have a power to stand by his side. Let's continue. Let's continue. 1989. Let's look at another one. Magical moments in, in every time. The Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. What? Reagan and the Pope conspired. You mean the United States and the Vatican got together? 
I wish I could give you the whole history of this. But I think we get the idea. His power should be mighty, but not by his own power. Look what it says, Saint. It's called an unholy alliance. And that's exactly right. And arms, speaking of that same power from Daniel 11, 31, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination of making death. And the part we want to deal with here not, not, is just the fact that an arm shall stand on his part. Daniel 8, 24 says his power should be mighty, but not by his own power. But Daniel 11, 31, talking about the same power, says an arm shall stand on his part. When the deadly wound is healed, it will be because America is standing by the side of the papacy by passing a national Sunday law, brothers and sisters. So in order for the Pope to make a counterattack upon this power that attacked him, uh, attacked their system in 1798, he would have to have a power to stand on his side. And we just see it here right from the screen. God had already written a blueprint and said this would be. Are you with me, Saint? Again, 1989, which is 191 years from 1798. 1989, the counterattack happened, just like the Bible said, just like God said. In the prophecies, the future is laid out before us clear. The events connected with the close of probation are clearly presented. Clearly presented, brothers and sisters. We have to be students, brothers, and we like to let prophecy tell us, not us tell prophecy. We have to let God tell us what it is, what it means. We have to look at history and find it and walk it down. Let's go. Pope brings down Iron Curtain. Pope brings down Iron Curtain. The Pope was convinced that communism faced inedible collapse and that Soviet bloc nations would turn to Christianity to fill the void. Let's look at it, brothers and sisters. When? 1989. Look at this one. Down comes communism in the wall. And at the time of the end, 1798, shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him, 1989, like a whirlwind with chairs and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Daniel 1140. Saints, can we, is there any, can there be any, uh, is it plain? The word of God is plain. And so here we see Daniel 11, 4 brings us from 1798 all the way down to 1989. Now I told you what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to go down to 1989 and then we were going to begin to back, we're going to go back and back up and fill in some more events that have to take place uh, between that time. What I wanted to do first of all is just show you that we are on solid ground. So in 1989, the counterattack was made, but now the sixth head is not gone. The sixth head cannot be gone until there is a law, brothers and sisters, by the United States enforcing a Sunday law. When that happens, brothers and sisters, the seventh head, which is America, will come on the scene and do her biddings. And, the, and Revelation says she will only last for a short time. We're talking about prophecy. We're talking about a weapon, also a weapon of mass destruction. We want to see now how this weapon of mass destruction that came out of the French Revolution is operating today. All oh, saints, this is, this is rich. This is good. I know that Jesus is soon to come. Soon he has to leave the most holy place, brothers and sisters. Let's continue now. Let's look at 1798 again. 1798, we move out to 1848. We got the Communist Manifesto. We move out to 1859. And we have the book, The Origin of Species. Now, let's look at something else. Look at our arrow on the left. We go down to 1844. We know what happened in 1844. We have the remnant church coming upon the scene. Now, I want you to understand some things. Let's go to Revelation now. Revelation 12, verses 17. Revelation 12, verses 17. We are studying the Word of God. We are looking at history and prophecy. Revelation 12, verses 17. We're familiar with that verse. Revelation 12, verses 17. Revelation 12, verses 17. And the Bible says, let's read it together, saints. Father, be with us as we study your word. And the dragon, which is Satan, after he's now been cast out of, out of heaven, he recognized that he's been cast out. In verses 12, he says he knew that he had but a short time. 
And the Bible says in Revelation 17, and the dragon, Satan, was wrought with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The remnant. Now, when, once he saw he was cast out in 31 AD, he started making war. He made war on, 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 the, on the apostolic church. He made war on through, uh, uh, through pagan Rome. He made war on the, on, on the church all, all, on through the, the dark ages. But then the medium that he was working through, which was, which was the papacy, received a deadly wound. And then we see that he came up with a new manifestation of satanic power to make open a vow war upon the word of God. Because through the papacy, he burned the Bibles. He kept them out of sight until finally he could no longer work through the papacy. Then this new manifestation of satanic power came on the scene. And the papacy, in this new manifestation of satanic power, the papacy went down, received a daily wound. And so now when the papacy went down, he come up with this new manifestation of satanic power. And 46 years later, it's amazing that I put this on the screen, 46 years after 1798, and you know in, in, in the Gospels it's talking about are uh, the fact that it took 46 years to build the, the, the temple there in Jerusalem. Uh, we see 46 years later that the sanctuary truth was revealed back to God's people 46 years after. The Bible says that he went to make war with the remnant of a seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that means from 1798 to, to 1844, that the remnant had not come up on the scene yet. But the Bible says that when it came up on the scene, he was going to make war with the remnant of the seed which keep the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, understand that he has unleashed a weapon of mass destruction. So he now has to infiltrate the seven-day Adventist church with this weapon of mass destruction. But God gave us the sanctuary truth that would have protected us from what Satan was, had unleashed upon the world. And all we had to do was obey the truth as revealed in the sanctuary. See, we think of the sanctuary as some of the small entities. And no, brothers and sisters, the sanctuary lays out the whole plan of salvation. It lays out everything that will protect us from the subtle workings of Satan. God, when that truth of the sanctuary was brought back into focus, into vision, in, seven, in, in 1844, God's remnant church simply had to obey the truths revealed in the sanctuary truth to, to keep from being in, infiltrated by Satan. It was that simple. It was that simple. So we see as everything in the sanctuary. Everything for our protection is found in the sanctuary. And all we had to do was obey the sanctuary truth. That three angels message all, there's so much there. And so he went to make war with the remnant of the seed which keep the commandments of God. So in order to make war with the remnant of the seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, have a prophet, he had to figure out a way to bring that weapon of mass destruction into God's church and dilute this truth, destroy this truth. And we can see, we are, look, we already see the results. How in the world could we have professors that in our, in our institutions that want to teach evolution? That means he's already succeeded. This is a personal thing, brothers and sisters. You and I must decide we're going to do what God says to do. Let's go. The mastermind in the confederacy of evil is ever working to keep out of sight the words of God and to bring into full view the opinions of men. In this slide, you can see this young man is reading a book I have on there, Charles Darwin, Theory of Evolution. Now, it doesn't have to have Charles Darwin, Theory of Evolution written on it. It could have history written. I mean, he could have psychology written on it, physiology. It could have any number of subjects. But you will find intermingling all the subjects, you're going to find this theory of evolution floating through it. It's a subtle attack upon the mind to erode your belief in the Word of God. I don't care what subject it is. I don't care what book it is. It's in, it's in all the colleges, it's in all the universities, it's on television, it's everywhere. And so the mastermind in the Confederacy of Evil is ever working to keep out of sight the Word of God and to bring into full view the opinions of men. 
He means that we should not hear the voice of God saying, this is the way walk you in it. Through educational processes, he is doing all in his power to obscure heaven's light. Where do we find instructions as to the word of God to tell us this is the way walk you in it? For Seventh-day Adventists, that truth from more than just the whole study of the Bible, I mean, and it's in the whole Bible, that sanctuary is through the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. God has given, given us special instruction through the sanctuary to make sure that we don't be infiltrated with this foolishness, Satan, this floating everywhere. Let me read it again. The mastermind in the confederacy of evil is ever working to keep out of sight the words of God and to bring in a full view the opinions of men. If the professor says it's true, then it's true. And he has the authority to give you your grades. And we have all these, uh, through education processes, he is doing all in his power to obscure heaven's light. That's, that's key. Through educational processes, he is doing all in his power to obscure heaven's light. Let's continue. For thousands of years, Satan has been experimenting upon the properties of the human mind. And he has learned to know it well. By his subtle workings in these last days, he is linking the human mind with his own, imbuing it with his thoughts, and he is doing this work in so deceptive a manner that those who accept his guidance know not that they are being led by him at his will. The great deceiver hopes so to confuse the minds of men and women that none but his voice shall be heard. Now we can see why... God has given us such counsel through the spirit of prophecy that we shouldn't look at anything false. We shouldn't use puppet, muffet, puppet, puppets and all these different things. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, stop your kids. Don't let your kids watch TV, watch this foolishness on TV. All these kiddie shows, don't do it. Don't do it. It's poison to your children's mind. Teach them the word of God. From the Bible. Teach them when you go in, when you come out, teach them the word of God. And I, I hate to say this, but our schools are no longer safe havens for our children, unfortunately. I, I, I hate to say this. As we go, you, you'll see. Our schools are no longer safe havens for our children. Our churches are no longer safe havens. Yeah, I'm sorry, but it's not. It's not. Satan is linking the human mind with his own imbuing it with his thoughts, and he is doing this work in so deceptive a manner that those who are being led by him don't even recognize it. Humanism. Continuing on, we see on our left, we have 1917, Leon Trotsky, Lenin. This is the, the revolution. On our right, listen, saints, on our right, we have the baby boomers. We have the baby boomers, 1960, the cultural revolution. We have a revolution on our left, and we have a revolution on our right. The baby boomers came on the scene between 1946 and 1964, the largest group of people that ever been born into the world at one time. As they have moved through history, they have caused problems all the way through history because there's so many of them. When they were babies, there were not enough diapers for them. They had to put in more diaper uh, factories. Uh, as they went into starting into, into, into school, brothers and sisters, there were not enough schools. There's shortage of schools, brothers and sisters. So, all the way through history, they have caused shortages because there's just so many of them. Today, 2011, they will begin to retire. Does that ring a bell? They are going to begin to retire. And there will not enough be enough Social Security for them. We're already in a financial crisis, which I, I'm, just, I'm just itching to get to that part in this, in this, in this, in this study. I'm just itching to get there because, brothers and sisters, that tells us where we are. You see, saints, this, this, this financial crisis we're in is not something that just popped up. Right now, everybody's talking about it, but saints, and I'm giving God the glory, I've been talking about this financial crisis coming for at least 15 or 20 years because it's prophecy that it would take place. Everybody's talking about it. Now he's here. But saints, to wait till it happened is no good. To wait till the son-in-law happened to get ready don't, won't do you any good. We need to get ready now. So this, son, this, this financial crisis we're in is not something that, that just popped up. God said this was going to be. We're in it. It's there in the Word that it was going to be. 
Look at this thing saying. So on our left, we have the, uh, a, the, 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 uh, the, the Bolshevik Revolution. On our right, the Cultural Revolution, the French Revolution, then the, the Cultural Revolution. Look what it says, saints. Through yielding to satanic influences, those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and glorify their creator, will become the habitation of dragons, and Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil men who reflect his own image. Satan is working on the minds of the youth to create an apostate race who will reflect his own image. I have at the top, Illuminati is an organization. Illuminism is an ideology. You remember that. Illuminati is an organization. Illuminism is an ideology. Now, I know we're probably getting close to my time on this particular disc, but we, we, that'll be another disc real quick. Saints. Out of the French Revolution, we got Karl Marx, we got Charles Darwin, and now we have a new entity that we need to put into the picture, a man by the name of John Dewey, a new name. We have Karl Marx, we have Charles Darwin, and now we have a man by the name of John Dewey, 1859 to 1952. Let's look at Dewey. Because Dewey now begins to take up the mound. He begins to take up the baton and carry this information on forward. Let's look at it. John Dewey. John Dewey, October 20, 1859 to June 10, 1952. He was an American philosopher, psychologist, and educational reformer whose thoughts and ideas have been greatly influential in the United States and around the world. He, along with Charles Sanders Pierce and William James, is recognized as one of the founders of the philosophical school of pragmatism. He is also known as the father of functional psychology and was a leading representative of the progressive movement in U.S. schooling during the first half of the 20th century. Let's continue with Mr. Dewey. The function of thought is to guide action, and that truth is preeminently to be tested by the practical consequences of belief. That's what, that's what pragmatism means. But let's continue with Brother, with, with Brother Dewey. John Dewey was a signer of the Humanist Manifesto. Many give him credit for writing most of it. So John Dewey was a signer of the Humanist Manifesto. John Dewey was, a, as you just read, was a top education. He, he, John Dewey was a teacher's teacher. In other words, he taught the teachers that came and taught your students. He was a teacher's teacher. He told the teachers what to teach. They came, he, he, they came to him and, and learned. So he was a humanist man. He, he, he wrote to him part of the Humanist Manifesto. Look what it says. Humanism would have men be their own gods. Humanism would make everything relative to what the individual perceives as improvement of, of detriment. Humanism denies the salvation of God and replaces it with salvation by men. Now remember... John Dewey, a, the teacher's teachers, he was over the teacher's colleges, he was a signer of the Humanist Manifesto. So in other words, the, 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 the teachers that came out of these, out of his, from under his teaching, came out with their minds tainted, and they came there and tainted your students or your children. Or you understand what, what we're seeing here? Let's continue. John Dewey promoted Humanism as a national way of life. Humanists in their zeal believe they are doing your children a favor to make them more happy by seeking to erode any faith in God and replacing it with a hope in their own efforts. Sound like French Revolution to me. We will replace Christianity with a religion of reason. Can you believe this, saints? Are we following the, the paper trail? Are we following history? Is this prophecy that's, that's been fulfilled, that's like God said it was going to be? There's more. There's more. Same teachings that led to the French Revolution. Illuminism. 
Let's look at it, brothers and sisters. The vast intellectual movement which made its appearance at the close of the Glorious Revolution in England, 1688, and continued until the French Revolution, 1789, is called Illuminism, or the Enlightenment. This is history. This is not something I'm making up. This is not some SDA, v the SDA theology. This is simply history. The new culture, advancing under the agis of reason, launched itself in bitter opposition to all the past in general, and in particular to the Middle Ages. According to the Illuminati, the exponents of the Enlightenment, the Middle Ages, victim of philosophical and religious prejudice, had not made use of reason, and hence they called it the age of obscuritism or the Dark Ages. The new philosophy, on the other hand, was to introduce an age of enlightenment. It was to dispel the darkness of the past. God gave the Seventh-day Adventist Church the sanctuary doctrine and the truths contained therein to escape this foolishness here that Satan has, has, has disseminated throughout the whole entire world. Our schools were to be different from the schools of the world, which we're going to talk about a little, a little later. I don't know if we're going to make it on this particular disc. Let's look at this thing a little bit, Father, brothers and sisters. Who was the first Illuminus? The very name Illuminati, Illuma. The Bible says that Lucifer was the bright and morning star. He was the light barrier. And so, the Bible says in, in let's go there as a matter of fact, let's go to Ezekiel the 28th chapter. Let's go there. Ezekiel 28. Let's look at verses 12, I believe. Yes, listen, well, actually, let's look at verses 17. We don't, we don't have time to read all this, so let's just go down to verses 17. Ezekiel chapter 28, and let's look at verses 17. The Bible says, talking about Lucifer, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted Thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. If you go and look up the Hebrew, because of your intellect, your intelligence, because of your intelligence. You know, we're, 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 we're speaking, so that's a real bright kid. We mean that's a very intelligent kid. That's what we're talking about. That's a bright individual. That's a very learned individual. So it says here, that, about the Bible says here, that thy heart, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So his, 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 his wisdom was corrupted because he was so smart, he got smarter than God, he thought. And that's where we are today. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. The first illuminist was Satan himself. And he came into that part when he spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden, looking at our screen now, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, but what's going to happen? For God doeth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened or in, shall be illuminated. Your eyes shall be opened or they shall be illuminated, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It is this, it is this, this belief, it is this anti-Genesis apostasy that has pervaded the whole world today, and we believe that we are gods because of our intellect. We don't need the Bible. Brothers and sisters, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, God never, reading from the book, Education, page 23, I believe, 26, God never intended for us to know the evil, only the good. It was not for our benefit to know the evil. But Satan said, no, you need to be, you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. So our educational system today teaches both the good and the evil. But God's school shouldn't do that. And the evil overshadows the good 
and the human mind is corrupted, brothers and sisters. Weapons of mass destruction that Satan has unleashed upon the whole world. And saints, this thing is so subtle that those who pass through it don't even know how their minds have actually been affected as they begin to resist certain truths. That's an indication that this thing is working in you and you don't even know it. It's so subtle and it's so serious. Let's go. Let's continue. Here's a book, The Unseen Hand, an introduction to conspiratorial, an introduction to the conspiratorial view of history by A. Raph Epperson. Listen to this statement, brothers and sisters. One of the reasons for the sad state of the science known as education has been the gradual introduction into the school system of the religious philosophy known as secular humanism. Brothers and sisters, we are simply following the paper trail down through history. We are proving that this weapon of mass destruction that came out of the French Revolution that Ellen G. White said would be disseminated throughout the whole entire world has indeed taken place just like God said it was going to take place. And that, brothers and sisters, God gave us the sanctuary to protect us from this, from this, from this demon. Let me read it again. One of the reasons for the sad state of the science known as education has been the gradual introduction into the school system of the religious philosophy known as secular humanism. Continue on. One of the conclusions of the Reese Committee investigating tax-free foundations, I wish I had time to really get into this one, something in the nature of actual conspiracy among certain educators in the United States to bring about socialism through the use of our school system. The movement was heavily financed by leading foundations. Now, my time is about up. But we're going to, con we're going to continue this, this, this study in our, next, in, our, in our next DVD. And you're going to get it very, very soon. Let's continue, though. Let's continue a little bit more. Another statement from this book, The Unseen Hand. The new name of the communist philosophy became secular humanism, page 376. Karl Marx was one of the first to link the philosophy of communism with the philosophy of humanism. When he said communism as a fully developed naturalism is humanism, brothers and sisters. Saints, do we see this thing? Do we see what is happening? Remember Ellen G. White? Let me read it. Let me read it. Reading from the book Education. Education. Reading from the book Education, page 228. Reading from the book Education, page 228. Look what she says. At the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine, but human. The centralizing of wealth and power. The vast combination for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many. The combinations of the poor classes for the defense of their interests and claims. The spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed. The worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France, brothers and sisters. The prophet says it's going to happen. Let's continue. Now, I'm going to come to a close with this, with this particular slide. Alabama. I used to live in Alabama. A very conservative state. And we really, I want to make, make you understand that it is a very conservative state because if this philosophy could enter into Alabama, that lets you know just how widespread it is because Alabama is considered, you know, a Bible Belt state. You know, people come to come south and they, and they go into, come into Alabama and the cities around, there's churches everywhere, church on this corner, church on that corner, there's churches just everywhere, there's, there's churches, 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 churches. So it is a Bible Belt state. So if this philosophy could infiltrate and come into Alabama, that let's just let you know how deep this thing is. Let's look at the slide, saints. Let's look at the slide. In the Alabama case, the appeals court overturned a federal judge's decision to ban 44 elementary and high school textbooks 
from use in public schools because they promoted the religions of secularism, humanism, evolution, materialism, and agnosticism, and other and th others. And this was in 1987, saints. Do you, do, you, do you understand what's being said here? In other words, the federal judge decision to ban 44 elementary and high school textbooks was overturned. 44 textbooks in 1987 in, was, in element, was, was in the elementary and high school. That means in your, your young kids, first grade, second grade, third grade. These books was there then in 1987. What did they teach? They taught the religions of secularism, humanism, evolution, materialism, and agnosticism in Alabama, a Bible Belt state. That lets you know how pervasive this is. So a weapon of mass destruction is in the state of Alabama. Let me back it up. That's just, that's, that's just, that's the uh, state, picture of the state of Alabama. But it also, this thing has invaded the state of Alabama. The weapon of mass destruction. Humanism has invaded Alabama. Now there's so much more that I need to talk about because we have to now see how this thing has entered into our schools. Then we're gonna pick up and bring on another leg into focus and, 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 and walk this thing on down. Brothers and sisters, let's get ready. We are at the end of the sixth head and the reason we know we're at the end of the sixth head, the counterattack started in 1989 on communism. So brothers, it, it, we now, secular humanism have to be wiped out. And the Tea Party is going to play a, a major role in wiping it out. A major role in it. We are at the end. The sixth head is about ready to go down. The Bible says it. The counterattack started. We are now 21 years after the counterattack counter started. When America passes this Sunday law, which is not going to be long now, the sixth head will go down and the seventh head will come on the scene. But when that happens, it will be too late for you and I to get ready. We need to pray and agonize with God now like we never have before. We need to go and read early writings, 269 to 272. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries, pleading with God. Their countenance were pale, expressive of an internal struggle. As we see the end approaching, and we see our condition before God at this time in which we live, we need to be on our knees agonizing and pleading with God. Lord, created me a clean heart and renewed me a right spirit. Go and read that, early writing, 269 to 272. Because that is the state that we should be in right now. That is what we are right now, prophetically. And then go and read Desire of Ages, I believe the page is 324, where it talks about this vital connection that we need with God at this time. We must have victory over sin before the Son of Law test in order to receive the seal of God, which qualifies us to receive the lot of rain, which empowers us to give the loud cry so that the other sheep that are not of this fold can hear this precious truth and Jesus can come. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? I saw jets of light all over the world. Let's become one of those jets of light as we come to a close. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, please let not these words fall on deaf ears. Let us become serious. And dear Lord, we ask for your help to do this work, but we cannot do it in our own strength. We need Jesus in our life. Thank you, Lord, for all that's done and all that you would do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.